This is Aliens and Artists, Part 1 with Mike Clellan. I'm your host, Stuart Davis. Mike is an artist, author, UFO researcher, podcaster, and experiencer. In this episode, we explore what the actual number of abductees and contactees around the world might be, and that phase of ontological shock when an experiencer really feels like they're going crazy. Also, how both non-human entities and shamans are able to inhabit and control owls, deer, insects, and other animals. Plus, disclosure, what does it have to do with the objectives of the non-human entities themselves? But first, Mike shares one of the most powerful experiencer stories we've heard on this show. Tie your shoes, it's a sprightly sprint. Well, you know, I sort of, so I can tell, you want to tell a story? I can tell some stories, some, some of these stories. So the, the issue is with, with some of the stories, and when I do a podcast, like, I have to tell the short stories, because they're really long ones. Like, Not on Aliens and Artists, brother. Take the, <laughs> lo- take the long way home. Okay. Okay. So I actually, before I did this talk, when you said, oh, let's do this thing, and let's do it on, you know, and so I contacted this one individual, and this is the standalone story, which is really quite there's no UFOs in it, first of all. She does have a funny UFO story in her life. She's asked me to call her Phoebe, which I'm going to call her. That's a pseudonym. She lives in California. So this is going back about four or five years ago. I'm at my desk. I get the email ping comes in, and there's this message that says, Mike, we got to talk. Here, look at these pictures. And it's this pictures, and it's a woman's hands on a steering wheel. And you can see her thighs and knees, and in her lap is an owl. And the owl's cute and looking up at her, and it's kind of tiny. It's a, it's a western screech owl, and they're not very big, you know, maybe eight, nine inches tall. So it's like sitting in her lap, and it's got these big, sweet, cute eyes looking up under the camera. And I'm like, okay. And she gave me her number, and I called her up. She proceeded to tell me, like, I kind of rate these stories. Like, oftentimes, the stories I get are very interesting and very good. And then every once in a while, I get one that just knocks my you know, self sideways. And so this was like the A plus stories. This is one of the A plus stories. And so she was driving at night and she was coming home from her job. She was working as a waitress. So she's driving down this lonely country road in in California through the forest. And she passes this little thing on the side of the road. Now, at the time she was driving, she was listening to an audio book and it was about shamanism. And I actually have that audiobook, and I, I could look it up, I, but I can't remember the title of it right now. But it has an owl featured on the cover. Like the cover is just boom, this close up of a great horned owl photograph. And so she's listening to this book, and the theme of the book is like how to tap into your inner shaman or how to become a shaman. So she's listening to this with an owl on the cover. And then she passes this little thing on the side of the road, and she says, What was that? And she stops the car on this lonely road. She backs up and she opens the door, right? So she's in the driver's seat. It's on the side of the driver's side and there's a little owl on the side of the road. So she, with the door open, she just scoops it up, puts it in her lap, closes the door and drives on and she f- gets her phone and she knew of the, that there was a, like a wildlife rescue service in the town she lived in or nearby. It's middle of the night and she calls and some answering service picks up the phone and they say, well, we're, we're closed now, but you can bring the owl in in the morning. And she says, okay, fine. And, and the person says, where's the owl right now? And she goes, sitting in my lap. The person on the other phone goes, what, wait, what, you've got a live owl in your lap? And she says, yeah, i got a live owl in my lap. Well, you can't drive with a live owl in your lap. Those things are dangerous. So you should be very careful as they have claws and talons and just be, it's a wild animal. And then as they're talking, like the owl is getting agitated. And she's like, um, y- uh, you're annoying my owl. I'm gonna, I'll bring the thing in the mornings, but i got to let you go because you're annoying the owl. So she hangs up and she's like, what am I doing? What am I doing? So she stops the car, turns around, goes back to the very spot she found the owl. She gets out of the car. She holds the owl in her hands. She sets it on the side or on the side of the road and looks at this owl in the eye and says, okay, you tell me I can take you home or I can let you go. And she gets this full body, just this full emotional sense of knowing. She says, okay. She picks the owl up, puts it back in her lap and drives home. She drives home with this owl in her lap. She gets home and her and she puts the owl in a little shoebox with a little towel and a little bit of water and pokes some holes in the shoebox. And the next morning, she takes the shoebox with the owl in it to the um, 
animal rescue center that works with injured birds of prey. And it's veterinarians, basically. So they take this and they, she's talking to the, to the receptionist, but she can hear the veterinarians in the back going, ow, ouch, ow, ow, like, ooh, like they're getting bit and <laughs> they're like, and they can, she says, she heard them say, wow, you're feisty. So she says, please keep me updated about this, whatever happens with this owl. I really want to know what happens. And so she explains, well, if we can rehabilitate the owl, they will make sure you're there when we release the owl back into the wild. And we want to know the exact location because we'll release it in the same spot where you picked it up. And she's like, that would be wonderful. She did find out later that the owl had a broken wing and would not have survived in the wild. And she got, when she got the call and they had done the x-rays, they said, okay, we have full confidence the owl is going to heal up fine, but the owl would not have made it in the wild if it would not have been able to fly. So she's like, oh, that's wonderful. So in this time leading up to this, she had been thinking about going into hospice care. And she had a story where her grandmother died. She was sitting by her grandmother's bedside, and everyone in the family was taking turns sitting with grandma. Grandma was unconscious, and she was there alone in the room. And grandma sat up, looked her right in the eye, and then died. And it was such a profound feeling. She said, I'm going to change my life. I want to follow this path. I want to go into hospice care. She talked to a friend. Now, I, th- I, I may be remembering this wrong, but I think it was the receptionist at the veterinarian's place told her, oh, you want to get into hospice care? I have a friend you can talk to. And so she got the phone number of this friend, and they made an appointment to meet and have coffee. So she went to have coffee with this friend, this woman who had been doing hospice care for a long time. And um, they just, what started out as one cup of coffee turned into this like five-hour talk. They just talked and talked and talked. And the hospice care worker had seen it all, done it all, kind of cynical, been in the biz for a long time. And kind of turned to her and said, yeah, well, that's all fine and good. You had a nice experience with grandma. But let me tell you, there's, this is a tough job. Like what, so there's things that happen that nobody talks about. People defecate in the dying process. People moan in pain. There's terrible pain. People moan in pain. There's blood. People bleed out of their orifices. And then to make it worse, there's like family members that are hovering around that are so emotional that just cloud everything. And she says, okay, so that's, okay, thank you for sharing all that. And she, and later, very shortly thereafter, it might have even been the same day she talked to the hospice care worker. She gets a phone call and they say, the owl's doing great. We're going to release the owl tonight at nine o'clock in the dark at the same spot. She had, a, she had given a GPS coordinate. And she said, I want to be there. I said, great. So just you be there. We'll be there in a van. We'll bring the van there. She says, I'm going to go a little early. This is, was a really powerful experience for me. She drives to the spot, but she has to, she realized she has to pee. She has to go to the bathroom. So there's like a little trail head there, which has got a parking lot and there's some woods there. And so she said, I can just go to this little trail. I know right where this trail is. I walk on this trail. It's middle of the night. I can just pee there. But she pulls in and there's a car parked there. She's like, oh no, it is okay. So she backs out and she pulls and she goes to the spot where the owl was hit or where the owl was on the side of the road. Excuse me. I'm a, she's assuming that it was hit by a car. So she pulls into the spot where the owl was, and there's, there's something in the middle of the road. There's a deer in the middle of the road, and as she pulls up, she realizes this deer has been hit by a car. And so she gets out of the car, and the deer is like moaning, moaning in pain, and there's blood everywhere. So she, she's like, I don't want this deer in the middle of the road. So she grabs the deer, and she drags it, drags it, drags it. It's moaning in pain. It's defecating all over itself. It's urinating. There's like blood and, and it's awful. And the, and the deer is like screaming in agony. And she drags us to the side of the road. And as she's doing this, this car pulls up. And it's the same car she saw in the turnout. And these two people get out of the car. And this husband and wife, and they get out of the car and they're like, oh my God, we hit the deer. It's us. We did it. It's our fault. Oh my God, it's totally us. Oh, I feel, we feel so responsible. This is terrible. Oh, and they're crying and they're crying and they're like totally like losing their they're shit. They're like totally, they're completely emotional. Like we did it. We did it. Oh, and they're crying in there. And so she drags a deer to the side of the road and she hugs this deer and the deer dies in her arms. So she's, she's there covered in blood with these people just sobbing next to her. And the white van pulls up and parks with them. And they open the doors 
and they pull out the little cage, and they let the owl go. When this woman told me this story, she was sobbing. Like, I'm telling the story right now, and like hair is like standing up all over my whole body. And she said, this whole thing was based on, should I go into hospice care? Now, I would equate hospice care, right? So hospice care isn't, it's not a shaman textbook role, but I would say it's shaman light. It's a shaman-like role to play in our society, to be a hospice care worker. So how did all that happen? How did back engineer, like, unpack how that whole thing came into being, that story? I, I can't, and neither can she. She has not gone into hospice care. I've talked to her recently. Um, she is doing some other work. I don't want to talk about it because it would give her identity away, I think. But she's very much a seeker, I'll put it that way. And that's something that I've seen in the people who have these kinds of experiences. It's hard to account for any of that without including a pervasive sentience which animates our environment. Which is not to explain it. That does not describe the mechanism. We can know who but not how, let's say. But how can one begin to know events like these without recognizing the interiority of our ambient environment? I just say that the script writers of reality are smarter than we are, and they are writing the script specifically, specifically to have maximum impact on the one viewer in the audience, which would be, would be me or be you. There's a script written in a play being performed to maximize the impact for you. One thing we find over and over again with experiencers is that they keep the strangest experiences in their back pocket, so to say. They lurk at the edges, listening, calculating what is safe to share, how soon, how much, and to whom. They may spend six months or a year with a therapist skirting the heart of the matter, Over and over, we find figures such as Robert Hastings, who spent decades in the field as a researcher. And then when the coast is clear, the work is done, they come out of the closet as experiencers themselves. And we find this with experiencers who work in the alphabet agencies, the military. People keep the weirdest shit to themselves, even after they've come out of the closet. So I'm guilty of this. Uh, most experiencers who share the weirdest stuff want anonymity. They desire no public attention. They just want someone to hear what happened to them. What ratio of the people you hear from, Mike, are in this dynamic? Oh, I'm, I'm going to say like near 100%. You know, that's so what I'm doing is I'm getting emails and then often talking to people on the phone or just doing long email exchanges with them. And in doing so, you know, basically the first line is like, I've had this experience I can't make sense of. And they'll tell me, because they're reaching out to me, I'm getting mostly owl and UFO experiences. Sometimes I just get owl experiences that are very highly charged. Sometimes I just get UFO experiences. Sometimes there's some mix, or sometimes there's other bird, or some other animal, or some other... Like, they're coming to me on purpose for a reason. And they're, they'll say... Often they'll say I've told this or I've told, you know, to people, or sometimes I'll get, I've never told this to anyone, but that's rare. But what it is more is here's my story. How does this fit into your research? And I cannot tell you. So oftentimes I don't hear the exact same story, but I certainly hear stories that have the same tenor or the same flavor. And I'll say that to them. So, so what I have, like I'm providing a service and my service is simply to say to these people, you are not alone. Other people share this experience. And then I will ask them the questions. And I say, like, I'm taking off my UFO investigator hat. I'm pushing it aside. I'm taking my shaman hat and I'm putting it on. And so I ask them questions like, you know, what was going on in your life before this event? And what happened after? What changed? And I'll always ask, what are your psychic skills? How would you rate your psychic skills? And usually I'll ask if you have any healing skills. And then they'll get back to me and oftentimes they'll say, you know, oh, before that event, you know, like, oh, my life was totally in this kind of, I was unhappy. I was in this sort of crisis. And then after the event, 
you know, I, I, I changed careers and I'm doing this healing work or I'm, you know, I'm not joking. Like that's woven into the mystery, that change. It's not 100%, obviously, but it's enough that there's a recognizable pattern. If you intuitively extrapolate globally, just a speculative mathematical algorithm, what kind of numbers do you think we're dealing with? How many contactees, how many abductees, how many featuring OWL as interface to the anomalous? What do you think the numbers are when it comes to experiencers on Earth as we speak? Oh, so I struggle with this so much because I, I'm doing it like I'm looking at the scatter plot in my mind, which is probably full of flaws, and I'm doing a visual estimate, which is probably full of flaws. So anything I say is going to be this rough. So the answer is how many people on Earth are, have had these experiences? Okay, so that I don't have an answer. I would say a lot more than we would dare guess. Like people kind of sit around and they go, hmm, 2%. That's a lot of people, 2%. <laughs> so, and then I think like, Whatever we're going to guess, I bet you it's more, you know, so I I don't know what it is, but it's unsettling how many it probably is, given the fact that I talk to a lot of people who say, well, you know, like, I don't think I've had these experiences, but, you know, I was driving home at night and I had this owl in the middle of the road and then I got home and it was two hours of missing time. And anyone who's dipped their toe into this research can kind of read into that story and say, I know something happened, probably. There's no way to prove that without, I don't have a staff to go out and sit with this guy and do, you know, hire a hypnotherapist. And even that would be suspect. So my sense is what I, I, I use the term and I don't use it much anymore because I just assume I use the term, the maybe people. In my first book, I used the term, the maybe people a lot because there was these people that would come to me and they would have these stories and they would just be a little bit murky and they would have, they were interesting and powerful and, and they had owls and they had UFOs, but they just didn't have the bullseye information that would say, oh, you're, you're an abductee. But boy, they had all the little points around that center, that bullseye. And I just have come to assume that the majority of the people that I kind of cautiously speculate might be the maybe people are, in fact, have had UFO contact experiences, what we would call abduction. And then how many people within the field, so we have a overall population, we've taken a slice out of that, which is the slice of the pie is bigger than we would expect. I'm proposing that it's larger than we would dare suspect. And then within that slice, how many people have had owl experiences? Well, you know, some people have had eagle experiences, and some people have had hawk experiences, and some people have had deer experiences, and and, and not in a screen memory sort of way, but in kind of a spirit animal sort of way. So I would say conservatively 25%. And then kind of like, if you got a couple glasses of wine in me at the bar, I would say 50%. If we shift that lens over to the alphabet agencies, the military, black programs, etc., how often do you hear from people with those kinds of backgrounds or employment? Those experiencers who could never or would never go public? You know, an off-the-record phone call, a private conversation in the back room of a convention or an email? So for me, it's pretty low. Like I would say, I get it a little bit, I don't know, 5%, maybe lower than that. Like I have said many times, and I'm really, I feel really blessed that I'm like doing this owl stuff because nobody really cares about it. It's like, I'm, you know, I know the people who are, have had other types of experiences flying the ship, people who claim they have flown the ship, (laughs) they tend to get someone knocking on their door or, you know, funny intervention into their lives. But I don't have that experience. And so, you know, it's pretty low. For me, it's pretty low. And then I'm often very cautious when people tell me those stories because I figure, you know, like, well, you're, it's an uh, occupation oftentimes that's where they're on the payroll trying to deceive people, you know, maybe for very good reasons. They're trying to deceive the Russians. They don't want to give away the, you know, the launch codes, you know, so they probably have all kinds of systems in place to obfuscate that and confuse that and to muddle that. And I suspect that's happening with the UFO thing, too. There are systems in place to obfuscate and muddle the information that gets passed around. So it's a little bit of a minefield trying to come to terms with what may or may not be happening behind that curtain. But for the people who reach out and contact me a little bit, but not, but not too many. So let's talk about your shaman hat. 
The longer that I've been in touch with your work, the more that I'm curious how it intersects with shamanism or animism. Specifically, I want to ask you about a link between how a shaman takes control of animals, insects, birds, as do non-human entities. A core element of shamanism is the capacity of the practitioner to inhabit a jaguar or a crow or a snake or an owl. And ostensibly, some non-human entities do this as well. This is a staple of experience or life. Innumerable accounts point to non-human entities having the facility to control deer, birds, insects, etc. So this isn't to say aliens are shamans or that shamans are aliens. But perhaps they have a skill set in common. Given your intimacy with the owl, have you ever felt inclined to command or possess an owl, as would a shaman, as do non-human intelligences? Is that something that's on your animistic radar at all? Not necessarily to command the owl, but I certainly have been in the presence of real owls and asked questions. Like fully said, you know, what's going on? Why am I here? What does it all mean? Why am I having these experiences? Why are you here? So I've certainly asked owls out loud those exact questions in, I mean, I've seen a lot of owls. Like people are kind of shocked when they, you know, like I kind of, here, look at this picture I got in the woods the other night. <laughs> and and uh, so like I've asked owls, you know, why are you here? What do you, what do you, what's your meaning? And I tend not to get anything. Later, I might get a powerful synchronicity or some something like that. But uh, uh, so I have never asked to like possess an owl or like to do it, you know, or to like you know f to f to fly to the you know to the other realm and come back with a message. I just ask them right there in the moment. I've talked to um, there's a woman Heather Kluwit Chikowski, and she's lives in Sedona, and she's a shaman. And she has had the experience of both, uh, of seeing an owl on a fence post under very highly charged circumstances, and then the owl flies off, and suddenly she was suddenly she was like struck with this visionary experience, and she was seeing the farmland below her, and she said the illusion was that the farmland was pushing up and going back away and pushing up and going up back away and what she realized is that the that she was seeing through the eyes of that owl as the owl was flying in a straight line over undulating terrain but to her it felt like the, the like the earth was zipping by below her and getting close and going away and getting close and this was at night and it she said it had a weird kind of uh, heightened vividness given the fact that owls can see at night. So her impression was she was seeing through the eyes of the owl. Like, I've never had that experience, but I have certainly wanted to talk, or I wanted answers from the owl. I wanted some sign from the owl. Um, and I've had, you know, follow-up synchronicities after asking those questions, after making that plea outwardly in a very formal setting, you know, like alone in the woods, facing a highly charged totem animal feels like a a ritual almost it seems like you've matriculated into the inner sanctum of the owl world if we're looking at merit badges <laughs> i think you've satisfied the process to have earned one of those first person shamanic experiences of seeing through the eyes of the owl if you had that option would you exercise it Oh, sure, I would. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could imagine doing that. You know, like I would be disappointed if I like, you know, took ayahuasca, which I've never done and, and didn't have like a powerful visionary experience with an owl. I'd be like, dang, you know, like what I like, I got the merit badge and everything. And now I can't even pull it off. So but um, but my sense is that um, like, as I said before, the universe is smarter than I am. And it's going to give me what I need, no matter how much I ask for what I want. That's a beautiful disposition to hold, one that I'd love to see propagate throughout the UFO community. Speaking of that broader community, I want to ask you about the Galileo Project as it relates to the disjunction between public narrative and hidden reality. So we have public-facing programs saying, let's get serious about UFOs, establish 
official government offices, change the tenor from the military branches, etc. So behind the scenes, anyone possessed of sincere curiosity and a modicum of access knows there's a highly advanced non-human intelligence in play, and that's been the case for a long time. Knowing how serious this is taken by those in the know, in the alphabet agencies, the military, corporate fronts, etc., it reveals the public narrative to be a farce. So how optimistic or pessimistic are you about an initiative like the Galileo Project? Do you feel like you're toggling between two realities? People very well in the, in the know saying one thing publicly, and then behind the scenes they are privy to a whole other reality, the reality status of UFOs? is a decoy, a a diversion, a delay. The genuine concern is what intelligence is behind this display of UFOs. Where do you fall on the spectrum of optimism slash pessimism with this section of the puzzle? Yeah, you know, how to say this, like, I went to art school, right? You know, so like, I studied film at NYU and promptly dropped out. So to in order to, in essence, see more movies, because I was living in New York City. And that's all I wanted to do was see old movies. So like, but I have the foundation of being in art school. So I was not beholden to the scientific process. So I was not beholden to, I was going to say, like, like, I almost want to say facts, right? Because you're 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 dealing in amorphous art, and in the mood, and the vibe, and the feeling, and the the impact of of something that's difficult to put your finger on, as opposed to you know how much something weighs on the triple beam scale. Uh, but so I like I, I like I'm, it's like it's like it's like not my job to like make people happy about about nuts and bolts stuff and and i just like i don't know what to say just let them like go chase their tail in the corner and like leave me out of it is is kind of how i feel um it is i I know exactly what you're saying because i've certainly talked to people and i don't want to name names but i've talked to people and they've kind of given me the lowdown and they say like oh this is what's going on behind the curtain and oh you know this is this is what um this is what they know, you know, like, here's the footage I've seen. And, and part of you know, so like, part of me is like, is this person being played, right? They're talking to someone in the government. Is the person that I'm talking to, and that is sharing the story with me, are they being played somehow by the government forces? To a degree, I bet you they are to some degree, you know, they're being given some information, but not all of it. And maybe of the 10 pieces of information they're being given, some percentage of it is meant to send them on a wild goose chase or or to be easily debunked so you know so like the i just i cannot i am nothing bores me more than the tic tac video and the the discussions that are being led by louis elizondo um i just feel like it's a it doesn't reflect my direct experience which is so profoundly weird they want to have a subject that is profoundly normal, right? It's just a, it's just a, it's just a aircraft that's a few years or a few centuries further down the, the evolutionary scale of 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 technology, and they can frame it that way, and they're content that way, and they ain't gonna break out of it, and, and nothing I can do to to change them in that matter. Which connects to the disclosure efforts is disclosure just about humans is it by humans for humans is it simply the primeval human reflex to other sentient beings and use that othering to justify insane weaponization to further fetishize technology what does disclosure have to do with the non-human beings themselves who have already disclosed themselves to whomever they choose, however, whenever they choose, what does disclosure have to do with the objectives of the non-human entities? So if I was like writing a screenplay about a, a 
disclosure event, right? So I would I would want in the fictional story, this is what I want, then this is how I kind of, like I have no evidence of this, but I kind of like maybe sense it. Like you'd have some guy in the basement of the Pentagon who's like, learned to channel you know like i'm just i've done a lot of research into the to the original stargate program with the remote viewers that were working for the military in the early 70s through you know russell targ and and that crew and some of them who are still around like joe mcmonagall and still doing good work and and but you know like like i would take one of those people if i was in so let me just say this this way, because I'm speculating, you're asking me to riff on this. If I was writing a screenplay, I would create the character, and I suspect and I hope that character exists out there somewhere, who is doing the work in the basement of the Pentagon, tapping in, channeling whatever word you want to use, to the alien intelligence, the intelligence that's not us, and I bet, I just feel pretty strongly, just in my gut, I feel like, Someone's got the, the 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 red phone to the aliens, and the aliens are basically saying, you know, follow our orders. Don't disclose unless we give you permission, or get ready for disclosure because you are going to need to do it because we're going to do it for you very soon, or some variation of that. Where where like I I mean, you know, Obama said it on The Tonight Show or something like that. He said something like, yeah, the aliens keep us under tight control. You know, they keep a short leash on us. And he was joking, but I just remember thinking that. It's like, well, it's sure, it's sure how it feels, you know. So um, uh, so my sense is that, you know, there's three members of this. There's a triangle, right? There's the the public, there's the government, and there's the aliens, right? The, the, gov- the, the government's not going to, wouldn't do anything it would be imprudent for the government to give information that the public was not ready for. So we turn the clock back 70 years. I understand why they kept, you know, why they hassled Kenneth Arnold and things like that to keep this stuff quiet. Um, That was a long time ago. I think the public is ready now. And I think the public knows they're ready now. And I think the government knows the public's ready now. So they're doing just the barest minimum, the little drip, drip, drip of information just to see how that goes out. And as far as I can tell, it's going out. Like, nobody cares. Like, I just, like, nobody. Like, they 60 Minutes did a thing on UFOs. It was the deadly, it was the dullest thing imaginable. Nobody really talked about it. There was a couple of things on Facebook. It didn't, like, change the public debate in any meaningful way. You know, so so my sense is the public's ready for it because the dull, the simplest stuff doesn't make a wave because I think people are have watched enough science fiction and watched enough YouTube videos. Even the people who aren't interested in it are have a up to speed knowledge that's beyond what the government is drip feeding us and and then the third thing is the aliens and they would be or the beings or whatever i use the term aliens all the time and i probably shouldn't because i don't really even know what that means but the the beings who aren't us the intelligent that isn't us they are they are just as much are playing a role in this if not the lead role in this in how it all unfolds is there a fourth category here? You know, one entities, two government, three the public, and four perhaps experiencers in relationship with the entities. Because the behavior of the entities has been to disclose themselves millions of times over generations, often along bloodlines. According to values we can't precisely calibrate, is it comical? <laughs> that humans imagine we're going to control the timeline or the nature of quote-unquote disclosure. (laughs) You know, that horse left the barn a long time ago. What's your take on that? Well, we're in a funny position where we're kind of immersed in this. You know, like I think of my brother who's not immersed in it as far as like it's not on his, you know, email. His email inbox looks a whole lot different than my email inbox. You know, my brother was an engineer for a, you know, big, industrial corporation for forever and and so he has a very different way of seeing things than his his little brother who went to art school so um yeah so i so uh i i talked with james fox this is going back a bunch of years now and 
And I also talked with Lee Spiegel, who at the time was writing for the Huffington Post. This was at a UFO conference. And I went up to him and, and I, I kind of said to Lee, I said, you know, Lee, I've been reading your articles in the Huffington Post. And he's like, oh, great. You know, we're like, it's a formal setting. And it was like the last, they have like a formal dinner at the at the uh, event in um, uh, the IUFOC, which is outside of Phoenix. And um, so I'm like wearing a suit and tie. It's like like a meant to be kind of like a formal event. And and so I'm saying, yeah, and I read your, I've been reading your stuff, and um, and I just say, hey, like, gotta ask, and how come you never cover the, the the abduction stuff or the the experiencers? And as plainly and calmly as he could could be, he said, oh, oh well, I do that on purpose because I want to be taken seriously. And I was like, oh. And so like a minute later, like literally a minute later, I'm I'm standing in front of James Fox, and James, hey, because we had we have a mutual friend, and so we've bump into each other. And so I said, hey, how you doing? And and he's like, you know, I'm working on this documentary and I think it's going to be a really big thing. And that's what later turned out to be the phenomenon, that, that documentary. And I said, hey, are you going to include anything about abductions in it or contact events? And he's like, well, no, we, we're not going to do that because we want to be taken seriously. And it was just like, this was like, both these events happened within, you know, five minutes of each other. And I just like, you know, my heart just sank. Like, oh God, I am not included in this debate. I'm not invited to the table because the people at the table all want to be taken seriously. <laughs> and it was really, it's a pretty shitty feeling. And then at the same time, I was like, like, I like how, like all I can do is the best work I can do, right? I can't, like, I can't, I can't force, I guess I could force myself to the table in a way, but it, nobody would appreciate that. And I would make more enemies than friends. But I mean, my sense is all I can do is, is the best work that I can do. And then I'll say also out of that mindset, that's that was kind of the mindset I had when I did The Messengers. Like I feel like that first book on owls, well, it's a weird book in a lot of ways. And and I wanted it to be written in a way that was readable and pragmatic and folksy and playful. But at the same time, I wanted to address the most difficult outlying questions that arise within the UFO contact experience. And and I was in a in a way I often say this, I say that you know the owls I didn't choose the owls, the owls chose me. And I'm so grateful because the owl in the owl myth and the owl folklore and the owl the owl portion, the owl, the role the owl plays within the UFO contact experience is so perfect to be used as a framework for addressing exactly those questions, the most difficult, the most challenging, the most bizarre aspects of the UFO contact experience. So I did the thing I do, which you asked a question, I went all around the block, and, I, and I'm not even sure whether I answered your question or not, and I, and I do that all the time. Well, there's an Ouroboros quality to these phenomena. So... We often end up with tail on our tongue, so to speak. But yeah, I feel like that's an answer, a sincere response. It points back to this divide between the public and private discourse. So many public figures talking about UFOs instead of who makes them, who pilots them. You know, we say this on the show all the time. UFOs are smoke, entities are fire. I personally find it difficult to reconcile the shallow antics about the ontological status of UFOs when intelligent, well-placed people know we are in a long-term relationship with highly advanced non-human entities. It's emotional for me because I know so many experiencers and what they go through, how difficult their incarnational path is. They're continually marginalized by those in the know, mainstream producers sidelining all abduction stuff because it is delegitimizing. And that might be funny if it weren't for the fact that non-human entities are real. They exist when we're not thinking about them. Abduction does not vanish because of someone's spin. Does that ever drive you nuts, I guess, is my question at the end of all of that. <laughs> the answer is yes, it drives me nuts. Totally drives me nuts. And at the same time, like, I can't live my life 
feeling nuts. I mean, I could, I would be miserable. So I gotta, I gotta solve that somehow. And that was back to my other thing where it's like, well, like all I can do is the best work I can do. And then, um, oh God, you were, I was just going to say something. So the people who are in control of the narrative, let's say, and the people that this, and what they're feeding, they are feeding the morsels to the non i'm going to say this this is going to i mean i'm generalizing just like you did they are feeding these morsels these false morsels i mean they're still true but they're but they're like the tiniest tiniest like insignificant part of the giant mystery but they're feeding those morsels to the people who did not go to art school right so the problem with the contact experiences it's a mess right so you like talk to someone at a ufo conference and they're like oh my gosh my life has been ruined by the you know, the demons that, you know, come in my room at night and I've had these horrible experiences and it's ruined my life and my kid's life and I know people who've committed suicide. All that stuff is true, right? And I, I, to a degree, and, you know, like, and then you, you talk to the next person and they're saying, oh, my space angels, my brothers from the Pleiades come and, and give me benevolence and tell me the secrets of the universe, you know, and I'm sharing this in my channeled message and I've got my, you know, and, and that's all true too. I mean, those people are experiencing that. I do not doubt that those people are experiencing that. I recognize how crazy making that must be less so for probably the people in the know that have all the file cabinets at their access in the basement of the Pentagon and perhaps, you know, laboratories or metamaterials that they can examine and as well as a really good working knowledge of this deeper mystery too. I don't think they, I don't, I think they have a pretty good idea of what people who have had the contact experience are going through, but they are focusing on something else entirely in their, in their public presence. You know, when they have, you know, Air Force or excuse me, Navy pilots talking on 60 minutes about seeing a Tic Tac over the Pacific ocean, but that divide, you know, one of them is, it's pretty messy you know, like to try to make sense of the giant pool of UFO experiencers. I mean, it's it's kind of a, it's a nutty scene when you go to a UFO conference and, and all the experiencers are there. It's wonderful and powerful and, and rewarding, but it would be tough to synthesize it and boil it down to one single thing because it's so disparate and, and just, I think, human nature just leads each individual down a different path. And that's that's how it is. But in a nuts and bolts bolts mindset you don't want that you want you want measurable stuff that you can that you can quantify and that you can focus on you you don't want that messy stuff that artist stuff right so i mean that's the engineer doesn't want his son to go to art school right he wants him to go to engineering school i just have a feeling that the you know let's say half the population is nuts and bolts mindset half the population is consciousness artsy mindset again generalization I think that, you know, half the population is gritting their teeth at the other half because they just don't like their methodologies and their, the pool that, they've, that they're swimming in, basically. That makes sense. If I sound disparaging or cynical about those in black programs or government, military, the alphabets, etc., it's actually the inverse. The deeper I dive into these puzzles, the more empathy I feel for those in formal organizations and institutions institutions, they're confronting an unworkable problem. Bureaucracy and high strangeness are an acute mismatch. The mystery is nimble and deep and weird, and our institutions are cumbersome and dull. What do we expect the Department of Energy to do with ontological shock, right? It's, you know, add myriad worldviews into the mix, and you've got a radioactive Rubik's Cube. I don't think they have a good move to make, and most people in those situations are doing their best. Has your feeling modulated at all in the past 20 years, 15 years, when it comes to these concerns? Well, it's been less than 20 years. I mean, it's been about 15 years, really. You know, there was, there's a seductive quality to the, to the conspiratorial aspect to this stuff. Right? I mean, it really like, ooh, that, and, it, and I recognize that, you know, like all the super soldier stories and the, you know, the, the SRI stories of remote viewing and things like that. And there's like this, well, if they know that and, they, and why is this? And, and 
I have to take a big step backwards because that's not where my heart is. Like that make the conspiratorial stuff is unhealthy for me. While the mystical stuff, the shamanic stuff, let's say, that's a, that's a catchphrase I'm using, the shamanic stuff, the totem animals, the, the personal growth, the, the psychic experiences people have, that feeds my soul. That, that is life enriching for me. So I feel much more comfortable, you know, in this side of the tennis court, you know, just and not worrying about what's over the net, you know, let someone else step, deal with all that stuff. So as you said before, it makes me crazy. It makes my heart sink that I'm being actively, consciously, like people have made a decision like, no, we're not going to cover this aspect of it. So Mike, you seem like a nice guy. I'm not going to, like, you're not invited to the table. So I'm not even sure what your question was. Now I did the thing. Again. So, No, I was asking if your feelings toward the human beings working in military, black programs, agencies, etc. If your feelings have modulated the longer that you've been in this work. So I'm asking, because I've drifted from conspiracy towards seeing them each as human beings in difficult situations. And so I'm curious about your 15-year arc as it relates to this human element. Well, so here I'll give an example. So um, Jim Semivan, who is an, who is part of the original uh, To the Stars Academy, he was sitting on the stage there behind Tom DeLonge as they had their, you know, their sort of uh, video version of a press conference or a press release. And, um, but he wrote, which I don't have it in front of me, I could look it up, but he wrote a the forward to one of the early To the Stars Academy books. I, I think Tom DeLong was the author of it. And it was, a, I think it was a fiction book about, or it might have been the one that um, Peter Lavender wrote. I'm not sure now. So there was a series of books that came out. He wrote the foreword to one of them. And in it, he very clearly says, I've had my own experience. And because of this experience, my views of reality have been altered forever and cannot go back to the way they once were. He's saying what every single UFO abductee has said to me in one form or another. My reality shattered, crumbled, and it's gone. I got to put it back together somehow. So he's saying, like you don't have to read between the lines. He's saying he has had direct contact. It changed him. It shattered him. And that he's he's now a different person. So that's that's a retired CIA officer writing that, signing his name to it, and putting it on a book about UFOs. So I would love to sit down and have a cup of coffee with Jim Semivan and 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 hear his story, and swap accounts and st- see where he's at. So yes, so I have a a lot of sympathy, compassion, and camaraderie. For anyone who has that experience. So, so your answer is yes. So my sense is there's a lot of Jim Sammy Vans out there. And very few of them have had a chance to say what he said publicly. That's so amazing. You brought him up. He's the next guest on the show. Oh, you're kidding. You're kidding. Tell him I want to have a cup of coffee with him. Ask him if I he's will. had any owl experiences. I could give you, I'll, I'll give you some questions. <laughs> I think it's a perfect example because it's humanizing. I, I know both you and I are advocates for experiencers. Experiencers have had a rough road. Does mental illness exist? Yes. That does not account for this. Does hallucination exist? Yes. That does not account for this. Does aberration and misinterpretation exist? Yes. That does not account for this. So having worked our way through those false filters, we're left with genuine enigmatic experiences that are central to the meaning of our existence. As advocates for the experiencers, I feel it's important to remove the partitions. We don't say, I advocate for experiencers who receive spiritual revelation but not for those who report trauma, or I advocate for civilians, but not for human beings who work in alphabet agencies. There are so many experiencers within the military, government, and its corollaries who cannot seek normal help and support. 
you can't hire a civilian therapist or get regressed or seek standard therapeutic courses. You're saddled with ontological shock and a diminished set of resources. So I love that you brought this up. Anytime I say something like what I'm saying now, (laughs) some people inevitably go, oh, you're an agent. You work for them. You do their bidding. And, (laughs) (laughs) you know, you can't win. Uh, But coming from the spiritual imperative to seek inclusion and to pursue the liberation of all sentient beings, the choice is pretty obvious. So along this line, I want to ask you about experiencers sometimes feeling like the children of divorce. They've got long-term relationships with non-human entities, long-term relationships with humans. They can feel stuck in an unworkable divide. One foot on the boat, the other foot on the dock, as the two drift apart, let's say. You can also think of the dock as consensus reality and the boat as high strangeness, let's say. So you strike me as someone who has not succumbed to the seduction of collapsing this mystery to a particular interpretation. You've never become dogmatic about all of this. What's your magic formula? for staying open and remaining in flux. Is that just your constitution? Did you come into the world that way? Or is it a set of skills you have honed over time through adversity? Okay, so I would say, let me ask, answer the end of that first. That So I would say, yes, I think I did come into the world this way. I had, I've always had this weird ability to see everyone else's point of view. Joe Montaldo, like on his little checklist of things, you know, like people who've had experiences, he does UFO contact research. He says, you know, if people are empathetic, if people feel empathy, if people are like, if 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 you walk into a room and everyone's happy and you get happy, you know, that's something he he says is part of the experience. As a, that's a clue to the person's. Uh, contact experience you know you walk you you can feel other people's emotions you can see their side of the the coin you can stand in their shoes i have always had that experience so i have the ability like i like i'm sympathetic like i understand the the nuts and bolts aspect of it or let's say the aspect of the people who are being drip fed and only can take in a little bit of the time i totally understand it doesn't make me it still makes my heart sink that public debate is so narrow so yeah so i came with that software pre-installed on on my hard drive, the see every side of the coin, or whatever the tetrahedron, or whatever the multifaceted thing it is—the Dungeons and Dragon sixteen-sided dice. And oh, and then the other thing is, I was very fortunate very early on in my coming to terms with this. There came a point where I was like, "Crap, I gotta like read some books." Very early on, I read Communion, which kept the question very open. Whitley Strieber's Communion, like he never latched on to any answer, and 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 he took every question seriously and looked at it from all kinds of angles. And then the trilogy from Jacques Vallée, which is uh, Revelations, Confrontations, and something else. There's a third one in that series. So there's a tr- Revelations, Confrontations, and Dimensions. That's, those are the three. And so I read those three books. Had a, had, like I am so grateful that I stumbled on those books, those four books, because they allowed me to like loosen my grip on the the difficulties instead of trying to solve it i was very content with the questions beautiful i love this theme of not necessarily making sense of it all but living the questions meaningfully when you look back over the last 15 years how do you see your development experiencers are going through normal human development, and they're also contending with extraordinary exotic territories. What do you track as the major stages of unfoldment in your life, particularly as it links to these phenomena? Okay, so going... So as far as me personally... Like I grew up in the, I used to, I make a joke, like my parents, 
Like I, I make a joke that I'm the last person to be raised in the 1950s. I was raised, I was born in 1962. So I, because my parents were, you know, my dad fought in World War II and I had this kind of leave it to beaver household that I grew up in. So I'm like, I'm the last person who grew up in the 1950s, even though I, you know, grew up in the 60s and 70s. Just the, the household that I grew up in had this really, you know, safe, stoic, clean, tidiness to it that that i that i that is of another era so like i feel like i had that was a good foundation to have as a person for me and anyway um and i fought it and rebelled against it as a teenager and everything like that but it's in me that that side you know so that had an impact on me i went to new york city and was a yuppie for 10 years so like i fully i had a gate in some freaking great restaurants and had like a nice apartment and like and i i did it i lived new york city to its fullest between 81 and 91 and then i moved out west and i started working for an outdoor school and i was for 17 years and then sometime after that working at different guide services and such so i i for 17 years i would do 30 day trips multiple times a year so i would go into the mountains with a team I was one of the instructors. At the end of my tenure at the school, I was one of the senior instructors, so I'd be leading these trips. I went into the mountains with a group of young adults usually, usually college age, and we would walk away from the bus on day one, and then we would, you know, in, in big wilderness in Alaska and Canada and the northern Rockies and the desert southwest, and we we lived as a small community right so it's very tough to explain this i mean we had one spoon 30 days one spoon no fork you know we could and and we didn't change our clothes 30 days in the mountains in alaska you can't take your clothes off right it's cold so you sleep in your clothes you get up you wear the same clothes that you put your clothes on on day one you take them off when you take your shower on day 31 when you're back at the branch so 30 days and i'm explaining this to stuff and i bet you people listening to this sounds oh that sounds awful and I would say exactly the opposite. I was more alive, more fulfilled. I laughed more. I sang more. I was more myself, the veneer that this world puts on us, this world here with the, you know, emails and traffic jams and, and you know, having to mask up to go into a grocery store and stuff like this world, like, feels like it subtracts my humanity. That world, like, it felt like my inner real self just blossomed and so did everyone else's. You know, so there's all these skills I could talk about. I could talk about tying knots and lighting stoves and predicting the weather, looking at the clouds and how to work as a team and stuff. That that was subordinate to the to the wilderness experience of everyone in that in your group, usually around fifteen people, twelve to fifteen people. Everyone got elevated, everyone laughed more, everyone was sillier, everyone worked harder. So I feel like I spent, you know, between 30 to 50, basically, those years, like immersed in this magic, powerful world that, that, that reassured me that, you know, human nature is, is this joyous, powerful, wonderful thing. And I have direct experience for that in a very, in a very real way. So it's not, it's not like something I learned in a book. So, um, and after that, so that was, it was in the end of my tenure at Knowles, excuse me, it was the end of my tenure at the school that I was working for, which is called the National Outdoor Leadership School, N-O-L-S. I, I try not to use their name, but you could point to them about one half of a Google click away from anyone figuring that out. But uh, so, so leading into my own experiences with the contact stuff, I like had stuff. I could tell the stories of like missing time and aliens in the backyard and and missing, you know, and, and seeing a close-up UFO sighting. I could tell all those stories around the campfire and just like, isn't that interesting? I did not go there. I was like, there was no way I was going to admit that this had anything to do with me. And in 2006, all that fell apart. And that's the story I've told too many times where I had, I had the, what amounted to my the opening salvo of my new life where the where I was I had a set of owl experiences in the mountains of Wyoming and it changed the direction of my life. But but I had the foundation of you know that very simple, simple life in the mountains, working those trips. And that very simple, simple life has like 
has played out in the rest of my life. You know, like I, I, that was, those life lessons weren't abstract. Like I, I use them. So I entered this arena unwillingly. It felt like I was forced into it, like giving how, how life events played out. Like I didn't have a choice. Like, like it was going to happen to me and it happened in 2006. And, and then I also say this, I say this all the time and I, and I, and I don't think people recognize what I mean, but I'm not mincing words. Like I'm not using, I'm not, I'm not saying it for effect. I'm saying it, it's because it's true. Between 2006 and around 2012-13, I spent 95% of my waking hours wondering if I had gone insane because the synchronicities and the life events were, were at odds with what society told me how reality works. Like, I was experiencing reality in a way that was completely diametrically opposite of what I had been told, taught by mother culture. Not so much, you know, a physics teacher or a church or the New York Times, but the entirety of mother culture said, this stuff cannot happen. But from my direct experience, it happened. And I suffered terribly. And then I I just got to a point where I was like, it's real. It's real. It's happening. I got to deal with it. And, and that was when I really started taking the, the um, writing seriously and started the first Owl book. From 2006 forward, what have been the most difficult aspects of being an experiencer? Was it what you just shared, wondering if you'd gone crazy? What would have made it better in those most difficult moments? Wow, you know... So, like, I can't, like, what would have made it better is if everyone was a little more open-minded. That would have been wonderful. Like, I felt like I've lost a lot of friends. Like, friends, well, let's just say some friends faded away, and those were replaced by new wonderful friends. So I didn't lose friends. I feel like I had the same number in a, in, in a very real way. But my my life changed in a way where I no longer fit in the circle of friends I had when I was immersed in the outdoor school. And when I was immersed in the outdoor school, the circle of friends I had when I was a yuppie in New York City changed. So, you know, I, I was changing. And what would have made it better is if if folks could be a little more open-minded or a lot more open-minded. But also that would be difficult because there's no dialogue. There was the dialogue in the public culture was very minimal then. I mean, there was the X-Files and there was, you know, kind of... Uh, unsolved mysteries and things like that, which were very tabloidy in the way they presented stuff. So um, the information was out there. I just wish it would have been presented in a more grounded way. Like, I'm going to say this. I'll say this right now. Your show is, I was really excited to be on your show. Like, I was really excited to get the chance to talk to you because you are doing two things. You're going way, way out on a limb with what you're talking about. At the same time, you're grounding it in a way that's that's not exploitative or tabloidy or you know something out of the tabloids so so that's and i have been trying to do that too and a lot of other people have been trying to do that so that sea change happens you know one book at a time one conversation at a time one podcast at a time so the world is changing i'm convinced of that and i can't i mean it'd be nice to speed it up i think that these kind of glacial forces are going to move the way they want to move you know we can you know, the ripples in the pond that you and I are putting out there are having an impact. It sure would be nice if it was faster, but I mean, all, as I said before, all I can do is the best work I can do and, and, and hope that it makes, that these ripples that I'm making have, are impacting the people who need the help, who need the impact, who need to, who need to find these stories. For more information on Mike Cleland, check the show notes. To hear part two of our conversation, just become a patron or a plus member. Click the link in the show notes and get access to an anomalous library of Alexandria. Oh, pre-patent patrons and plusers. In the mistranslated words of the wildly popular Persian poet Rumi, quote, out beyond right and wrong, there is a field. You can't get pregnant there. That's true. End quote. 
Join me in the prophylactic pleasure of patronage. Just click the link in the show notes and toss your birth control into the contraceptive mix of the river sticks. Signals is a book of poetry written in the constructed mathematical language of Linkos. Linkos was originally created by Hans Freudenthal in the 60s as a method of communicating with extraterrestrials. The inspirational source behind the poems in Signals is data collected from the Kepler telescope as it searched for habitable planets and or alien life. That data was transposed into this collection of visual poems composed in Linkos, which is also known as a lingua cosma. When Freudenthal created Linkos, he intended it to be a spoken language, albeit one constructed from radio signals of different wavelengths converted into biologically utterable phonemes. I have to say that this idea calls to mind what myself and other experiencers report in Mantis Entity Encounters, in which a cascade of electric pops, clicks, and buzzes are transmitted from mantis beans to human recipients in classic download events. But that may just be my projection. At any rate, Canadian astrophysicist Yvonne Doodle and Stephanie Dumas used Linkos to send messages to neighboring star systems from 1999 to 2003. Linkos and the poetry of signals does call forward the manner in which patterning underpins human communication. One way to view languages is as discrete patterning systems, stable enough to be transferred intact among populations, but dynamic enough to unfold new patterns in tandem with the evolving consciousnesses that house it. In my own opinion, one irony with Linkos and really all attempts to create an interlingua designed to facilitate communication between humans and non-humans is that a non-humans are already here and have been for a long time b they are nearly all telepathic <laughs> c when necessary many appear already possessed of a universal translation capacity so they can easily dip into English, Gaelic, or Mandarin should they desire, and D. Many non-humans also demonstrate the ability to select from the deeper lexicon in an experiencer's mind, which includes archetypal symbolism, emotions, and our unique spiritual essence. The entities are able to braid such elements with conventional language to create communication of another order. The variety of signaling is tailored to the individual, often acting as a time capsule or a seeded potential to be activated and integrated at a later stage of life. In an interview with Vice Magazine, which we link to in the show notes, Carter shares this thought about the poetry in signals. Quote, This is an attempt to communicate with alien beings. But in some respects, when we think about our contemporary situation in trying to manage a changing world and negotiate all things it's generating, so much of that is trying to understand the signals that the Earth is communicating to us. To be able to understand what they mean and to generate meaningful responses to that, to read the scriptures of the earth and the atmosphere to lead us, perhaps toward a better future." End quote. Pretty hard to read that and not think of crop circles, for me at least. Richard Carter is an artist exploring the more than human within digital activities, objects, and environments. Richard's practice traverses both the technical and the textual, developing hybrid works that tell different stories about the contemporary world. Aliens and Artists is brought to you by The Liminal Muse, 
offering one-on-one sessions with me, Stuart Davis, sessions focus on creativity as a spiritual path, past life regression, and cultivating human sovereignty for experiencer practitioners. Go to theliminalmuse.com or click the link in the show notes. a blessing and it's probably aching from the laughing at the at the sight of all the seekers at the sight of all the sight of all the seekers chasing their assassin as they kneel before kneel before a butcher and beg to skip the bloodshed If a reaper learns a lesson and it's keep the angels second guessing while you stuff the posers back in the bodies and we all know God is a sucker for a monkey She'd probably love it if heaven were heaven were a jungle Makes a reaper wonder She's feeling If a reaper Has a question What beast keeps Its pulpits in the clouds Children in the bunker Makes a reaper wonder 